Okay, so hello. <laughs> uh, the next section we are going to be covering is Warcraft. So uh, our Dark Lord Darien here will be heading that. So take it away. Um, all right. So like I said, when I did the Reeve, uh, the Reevecrat, Reevecrat stuff. Sorry, speaking is hard. Um, when I when I mentioned this in the Reevecrat, I usually have the same person do both roles because of how closely they're linked. Um, so feel free if anyone's got a comment to say uh, anything if they if they think of something that I don't do that I don't mention here that I really should by all means feel free to mention it I might have covered it in the Reeve conversation already um, so when you're doing Warcraft you are the one choosing the battle games you're figuring out what the the fighting portion of the event's going to look like uh, a lot of the scheduling and, and deciding what's happening is going to come down to you uh, you're going to want to talk to your cytocrat and you're going to want to talk to your autocrat because the cytocrat might have a site that doesn't fit the type of game you want to run. Um, running a bot D style capture the flag at Raven's Knoll isn't really going to work because we don't have bases. Um, you can definitely am amend the game style to, to fit it, but you're not going to get the exact same style of game. Um, so you're going to you choose or write uh, a new game. We've had plenty of events where someone has come up with a brand new uh, game style, something like Phoenix League. Uh, I believe Tyler came up with that. Uh, and it was radical, it was new, it was something that required play testing, um, and, and definitely a sales pitch when, it, when he came up with it. So you're going you're gonna to want to think things through. Choose what you want to, what you want to run, be it a game that pre-exists, or if it's one you're writing. If it's one you're writing, um, you're going to want to play test that a few times to work some of the bugs out before you get to the event itself. And you're really going to want to think about your balance mechanics and um, do a bit of testing to see if anyone can break the system that you've built because sometimes you don't think of spell combinations in the game style you've created that just become overpowered because of uh, cursed ground or because of um, terrain effects that you've put into the game. So give it a try. Let people try to break the game. And if they do succeed, figure out rules around that. But that's, that's pre-event, not pre-bid. So choose to write your games. Um, traditional or non-traditional games? Um, a traditional game being like Capture the Flag at Bot D. That is our game. That is the one thing that we've always run. Um, I imagine that will always be the cornerstone game of Battle of the Dens. That doesn't mean it always will be, though. It, there may come a time to break with that tradition, but currently, there's a signature game. Think about if you want to run that one, or if you want to be the one that um, takes that brave, bold step out and changes that. You have options when you write uh, your bid. Just because something has always been one way doesn't mean it has to be. Um, but you are going to get some pushback. Uh, traditionalists, if you try to run a bot D without a capture of the flag, people are going to speak up. Thing, just points to ponder. Um, if you come up with a new game that isn't going to work, say you replace the CTF at bot D, um, with a game, the, a game type you came up with and you realize playtesting, it's not going to work, you can change your mind later uh, for whatever reason you want. So don't be afraid to go out on a limb. Uh, some of the best games we've come up with were people going out on a limb. And Phoenix League has taken off across how many kingdoms now is it? I think almost all of them. <laughs> Someone came up with a brand new idea and it's now across all of Ampgard. So your idea might might not work or it might be the the next great way great wave that just takes the game by storm. Um if you're not brave enough to take that first step though, we will never know. So, once you've chosen your game, uh, you're going to want to think about your materials and costs. For Bot D, our CTF there, require you need armbands. At kingdom level events, 
your battle games need armbands. At a Shire level event, you're probably dealing with mostly all the same people you normally recognize. I'm pretty sure if uh, me and my lord uh, Valiant went down to Heathen's Cove and we're both in our full gleaming armor and we go down to the battlefield, as a new park, I don't think Heathen, Heathen's Cove has that much armor and we are going to stand out like a sore thumb so they can say, hey, the guy in the chain mail or the guy in the plate mail. Um, we're very we're very noticeable and they're going to know who's on whose team but when you start having 20, 30, 50 people split up on two teams that don't go to that park normally you're going to need to identify them this can be armbands, headbands tabards um, depending on how adventurous people want to be war paint um, but think about what, what that's going to cost and go with that. Like I said, Bot D, it's always been armbands or headbands. Uh, that's three feet per fighter. So if you get a yard of broadcloth for $5, you can probably get... Three times three is uh, nine. You can probably get nine headbands per yard of that. How many, are you, how many yards are you going to need to fit up... Uh, sorry, to outfit... Uh, a hundred fighters. So, also surgers. Like 10, surgers 11? are great. They they can make up the headbands in a real real quick real quick. Yeah, because it even does the cutting for you. Yes, it does. <laughs> um, so yeah, when you're thinking about these things, um, that's going to be a huge cost because you need eleven yards at five dollars a yard. That's fifty five dollars right there. We haven't even talked about taxes, and. You've only started. You've only got one battle game set up now, so definitely think about what you want to do and what you're going to need to do it. Because if you have props that go with every game, and every game's going to need headbands, every every game's going to need um, uh, foam, uh, a foam dog skull, or a foam whatever that's going to be custom made, those are all going to cost a pretty penny, and that number just keeps climbing. Um, so think about your costs when you pick your games. Also, don't be afraid to go to your to your local park and uh, ask if somebody has the dog skull if you're running jugging. Um, I'm probably going to have to actually clarify because jugging is not that common anymore. The dog skull is about the size of like a Nerf football. It's, it's about the same consistency. It's a big foam ball. Um, uh, Wolvenfang, I think, had a wolf-shaped one and uh, Felfrost had a moose skull shaped one I think someone will probably correct me in the comments <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, that was you needed one of those because you're trying to get that the dog skull you're trying to get it into the enemy goal kind of like a game of soccer just I'll think about football with weapons it's really fun uh, I'm going to come back around to jugging later on but um if you need something like that for every game you're running, a dog skull by itself is going to be be expensive depending on how much you want it decorated. Ask around. Someone might have it. They might not. You need to make sure that you get the money set aside in the bid so that you can afford to get those things. Um, There's also some things where you can have workarounds, right? Um I've seen jugging done with pylons, where uh, you have like um, a little pylon on each end, and then you've got like a bigger one that fits on top, right? Um, all the, they just need that one thing, and they can just go and throw it on. Right? Oh yeah. Um, so you, there's workarounds. You can always find just different materials. Um, oh yeah, Phoenix League kits is the thing too um, Tyler just mentioned right that's mm -hmm. another thing if you're doing Phoenix League right you're gonna need a ball and you're yep. gonna need two baskets right um, if you if you're playing with the competitive rules you need to have uh, the the boundaries marked right um, a lot of times we do that yep. with uh, different color rope so uh, you can see like the sections of how much um, feet each thing is um, so yeah, mm -hmm. depending on what games that you have, um, but also, uh, sorry, just like one thing. So, um, By all means you can also consider, um, <coughs> having games use the same items, right? Um, if you are doing something where you can use 
you've got a set of pylons and you can use them for every game, right? Uh, maybe just be mm-hmm. like, okay, all I have is I'm doing a Shire level event and I've just got a bunch of different size pylons. Okay, all of my games are going to involve these pylons, right? I'm not going to go out and get different things. We're going to do pylon games, right? You can work around with the materials that you've got and what you can afford and things like that. But just, you know, yeah. options. And, and you have to think about reusability too, eh? Um, where, where you're going to use pylons to mark out your boundaries. You can buy the, the professional chalk that they use for um, soccer, soccer fields or baseball diamonds. It might not seem expensive at first, but... <laughs> That number will rack up over time. Same thing, uh, there's uh, water-based spray-on paint that you can use to mark lines now, too, in grass. But it's a one-use thing. Once you lay that chalk down, you're not going along with a broom and sweeping it up afterwards. So um, try to think reusable, uh, at least for the first few events, uh, for your bid team, for you and your friends, even if you're just, uh, if you intend to keep war crowding for other events and building yourself a, a bin of stuff think reusable because reusable is going to be 5, 10, 15 years solid. Um, okay. um, necessary weaponry. Okay, so jugging and tournaments have specified weapons. Uh, when you're going to run games that have specified weaponry, um, jugging requires one sword and board, one dagger, uh, a, f- a flow fighter, a flail and board or flail and sword, and a great weapon. If you don't have all of these, um, for each of the positions, sorry, there's five people on the field and they all have different equipment. So it's hard to run. Like... Yeah. It's going to be hard to run a game if you don't have that equipment there and the two teams show up and none of them have uh, shields, let's say. The fighters just don't own shields. Well, now you can't run the game. If you have the shields, they might not be the greatest shields, but they're shields. And uh, if I show up with my shield, I might say, okay, I'll use this shield because it's unfair that I have a good shield and that, that new fighter doesn't have theirs. But that's that's an ideal scenario that everyone shows up carrying the weaponry they're going to need. You as the Warcraft, be ready to provide the weaponry. And if you're ready for, to do jugging, you're going to be ready for tournaments. Because tournaments are something that new players are going to want to jump into. But a lot of players a lot of players I've known got their, their first sword done, their first short. And it really didn't get a second sword done for the first six months. Or, or the next shield done for for a whole year so they're not going to be able to jump in that tournament if you don't bring the equipment for them to make all that equipment might cost money but this is where your parks might have loaner gear i know wolvenfang is loaner gear and if i were to ask uh crawl to borrow it i i'm pretty sure i could um for a tournament event and um, crawl usually being my reeve crad I, I haven't had to go ask to borrow it from him Funnily enough, he usually brings it. Um, so, did you have anything to add for for equipment and weapons and other things for games and tournaments? No, that's pretty solid. Pretty solid. Yeah, like, and, and that's it's such a huge thing too, right? Because like, uh, that's that's enough to break your event, right? Uh, if if you if your entire event is a is a jugging championship, and uh, no one shows up with daggers. <laughs> uh, you, you're 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 in a, a bad situation, right? Because uh, there goes your event. You'll have no quicks, and no one can move the dog skull, and this is going to be a really long game. It's really long game. Also, <laughs> uh, weird stuff like oh gosh, y- you also have to have something to mark this like the stone count, right? Uh, so sometimes you just have somebody that's got like beating on a shield, right? With their, their short sword. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes uh, folks legit have like drums and actually like uh, do the actual, you know, yeah. one stone, two stone, right? Like they're going through and actually have a drum for it. 
right? Just any weird yeah. mechanic that you that you have in there, you want to um, make sure that that's counted for. If jugging becomes big again, I'm just going to make myself a, a digital copy that I can play on my cell phone or something. I'm not standing oh, there banging yeah. a shield anymore for 300 stone. You, your voice um, is so raw. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, you uh, for jugging, for a lot of the new players, when you're counting stones, you smack your shield one stone. One, two. Bam! Two stone. <laughs> three stone. Four stone. And you have to count to 300. That's a round. One actual game of jogging is, <laughs> what is it, three or five rounds long? I forget. Oh, I think it's the first to three. I think. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so you have imagine to be counting loud the three. enough for the whole field to hear you. Just Over hear. the fighting. <laughs> just raw. Just raw, baby. Like, by round two, uh, just like, oh, this was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, rough, I know that we did uh, jugging uh, in Wolvenfang back in, <laughs> I want to say, December or January, and me and Roger were trading off stone counts, because oh. it, it is that bad. Um, Solid. But it is a fun game. Uh, I just want to automate that process so I don't have to do it ever again. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so where was I? Where was I? Yeah, yes. Scheduling. Um, before you, the bid even goes in, you, the autocrat's going to need a schedule. They need uh, something to show what the event's going to look like, in theory, to the park, to, to the monarchs, to everyone. Um, when you are scheduling your games, you have to schedule your games, you have to schedule your tourneys, you have to, and you have to think ahead when you're doing these things. When you're scheduling a game you're going to want to give yourself a few extra minutes in case it runs long. When you're doing your start time for the game, you're going to want to give yourself a few extra minutes to let people get there. And then a few more minutes to, to do your team balance. Now, this is where um, you're going to work in, in tandem with your Revocrat. Because you might not be doing the team balancing, it might be your Revocrat, or it might be a combination. Um generally give about 15 minutes between the actual lay on call and and what you put on that schedule otherwise um you're gonna have people showing up late uh you're gonna be eating into your fighting time trying to balance teams looking around figuring things out uh, and you might be eating into the next class's time because your game ran long if your game runs short um you have two options. One, everyone can scamper off to go do the next thing right away. If it ran really short, you could possibly say, hey, anyone want to do a round two? So don't be afraid of having, don't be afraid of budgeting a little bit extra time because it will save you uh, a lot in the end. And all of the other crats are going to thank you for running on time. So that brings me to the other side is especially with tournaments balance your game balance your schedule for your team makeups for the number of players you're expecting if I'm running a Shire level tournament I'm going to expect 6 to 12 fighters maybe I don't, I don't even think I'd get 12 fighters at a Shire level tournament and I know that one match uh, sorry one round in a tournament is going to take about 2 minutes and I know that um, one uh, one full bracket is going to take me about 10. When you get used to, to balancing, or sorry, when you get used to reaving uh, tournaments, there's a really weird inverse thing that happens um, with um, tournament fighters. People who are new to fighting, low orders of the warrior are going to have a longer time fighting. And as they get better up to about, I want to say, 5th or 6th order, the time of the how long the fight takes seems to drop a bit and then around sixth to eighth order it goes up again and around seventh eighth orders when you see those tier fighters they're going to take longer fights nines tens and knights for some reason i don't know why they tend to be faster fights um but that, that's out of experience i i know that the flow of this and i i can guesstimate my average time um but keep it in mind, if you have two new fighters, 
uh, and you say, okay, lay on. In a tournament, they're going to try to feel each other out. They're going to do these wide sweeping swings. Um, they're going to be a little bit more timid about getting into the fight. So in a Shire level tournament, it's going to take them about two minutes before they'll really engage. And I have to run at least two. Uh, I have to have two fights per bracket. So that's going to take me at least um, four minutes for them to even just start swinging at each other. Or sorry, two minutes to get them swinging at each other, then two minutes again to get them swinging at each other again. And possibly another two minutes to get them swinging at each other a third time because they both won one and I now need to break the tie. Um, there also might be simos. There might be arguing of calls, right? There's going to be weird... Oh, all of a sudden, there's a dog running through our field and we have to stop. <laughs> or, had oh, it. Um, they just did a thing and they snapped their sword in half. Uh, do we got another sword? Oh, you have one in your yeah. car? Oh, you have to get to your car and grab it and come back? Oh. Oh. <laughs> For replacement, yep. Yep, yep. Uh, we, We've also had, uh, many of us are getting into that age range where we're having kids and um, we've had children run into the tournament. <laughs> Um, and the Reeves have had to step in and, and like (laughs) use their bodies to shield the children. Um, (laughs) yeah, holds will get called for weird reasons. Uh, I know that I have seen, um, uh, two players here. I'm not going to say their names is I know there's at least a half dozen Reeves that have helped Reeves. Some of my events that have watched these two fight. And they had seven Simo matches in a row. Seven Simo oh. matches in a row. <laughs> Brutal. We ran... Uh, this was in Florentine. We ran all the way. It was in the semifinals for Florentine. And one side of the semifinals was done. We knew who was going up to the final match. We knew who was going in to fight for third. And um, we just stood there waiting. And, okay, we're going to start uh, sword and board now. And... We were halfway through Sword and Board um, at, at a principality level event before these two had finished their Florentine bouts, and we could finally figure out who was going into the title match for Florentine and who was fighting for third. Um, sometimes it takes that long. It's just how it goes. Um, and hilariously enough, uh, those two fighters are both at se- uh, seven and eight in their warriors, respectively. Oh. <laughs> so, um, you there is there are certain things that you will get a feel for over time, but generally know that you're going to need about I want to say a good solid seven minutes per uh, per bout per yeah per bout. So take the total number of fighters, divide by two, times seven minutes. Then you can divide that number by the number of rings you're going to run. So Warcraft sounds like it's a lot of um, hit stick kind of stuff, but there's actually a lot of math that goes into this. <laughs> um, your um, tournaments. If you don't give yourself enough time, you will run long. If you give yourself way too much time, People are going to find themselves bored and and you could possibly start up ditch games or something. Um, Funnily enough, those who are very interested in ditch games and those who tourney tend to overlap significantly. So don't be afraid to budget a little too much. But when you take up five hours in your afternoon for a tourney that takes the better part of 45 minutes, mm, that's over budgeting. (laughs) You also might want to consider... um like folks that are not interested in the tournament scheme, you know, uh, seen at all. And, you know, you might want to have like a class battle game happening in another location um, for folks that, you know, are heavy into that and don't, you know, particularly want to do tournament. Just having options. Uh, What I've tried to do for some of my events is to set up ANS classes at the same time or run uh, basic archery skills courses at the same time. Because what happens is, is those um, the people who like fighting with a bow aren't usually tourney fighters, so it tends to balance out very nicely, specifically in that way. Uh, so we Did, do we have a question coming? Um, oh, this is where some hammer rules could be useful. Where too many, um, where too many simos get 
both players DQ'd. Ooh. Interesting. Uh, I've never um, seen that before. I have heard of that. I'm not... Okay. I have heard of it, but I am not a fan of it. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's fair... And, and this is my personal opinion. You can take it or leave it. Um, that system I've heard of being used for expediency's sake and in an emergency. Yeah, it makes sense to do, but I, I personally don't because prime example is that semi-final match. These people are fighting at a principality level tournament and one of these two people is going to be given a title level shot, which means they might actually place in this tournament. And that's a big step on their road to Sword Knight. It would be, I, I personally feel it would be unfair to, to deprive them of that opportunity. But I do recognize if they're on about their 12th or 15th Simo, we, we have to come up with another solution now. <laughs> These fighters were too closely balanced. Um, and hint, when you're doing your next, bra next set of brackets for the next... Uh, Attorney, make sure they don't meet. <laughs> the don't. first match. The <laughs> first match right away. No. <laughs> I've seen that. I've seen uh, that too. I've seen yeah. it so bad. <laughs> uh, the earlier in the tournament that is, the worst it gets. <laughs> so uh, just to follow up, uh, the reason for yeah. it is, uh, in Hema is... Uh, to encourage defending yourself instead of just wildly swinging. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a valid point I didn't think of. I, I definitely think that's that's something to consider. Um, Hema, of course, is a very different sport. Um, but it is something to definitely consider, and I think if the fighters know that going in, that might be a very fair way of dealing with it. I'd have to look at the rules. I don't know how many... How many Simos are, are too many in HEMA? Yeah, I, I guess 12, the biggest I think thing is... is, like, knowing that there are options, right? Um, that yeah. there are different ways to do it, and uh, it's you have to choose what options you want to do, um, so long as you just make it clear um, what rule sets you're going by and why, right? Like, um, yeah. yeah, it's just a matter of uh, making sure... Sorry, in Hema, it's normal, uh, normally two, but I've also seen three. Okay. So that, okay, so that's the, the limitations on it. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. I'd have, I'll give that some thought for, for the next time we, we run a tournament. That's, it's definitely, it's definitely something to consider. Thank you. Um... But with that said, uh, don't be afraid to go outside AmpGuard just for inspiration and ideas. Uh, Fantasy Alive can give some really good ideas towards um, crafting or questing, role-playing, things like that. Go, um, go take a look at HEMA. Go take a look at SCA. Go take a look at um, DAG or BELL. Because... Fencing. <laughs> Sorry? Fencing. Yeah. Because we don't have all the answers. We got a lot of them. We've got a lot of experience, but we don't have all of them. And somebody in Dagger Bell might have a much, a much better um, idea on how to deal with something. Uh, so we have one more in um, from mm -hmm. Wound Joe. Uh, you could also do sudden death, uh, like first wound, uh, after a lot of mutuals. Uh, it removes mm -hmm. the atomic clock. Again, um, right? I think we options. It's it's one of those know that there are different ways to do it, and then choose mm -hmm. what you think is going to be the best thing. But make sure that uh, you're not making up rules on the fly. Uh, that you are accounting for these things ahead of time. Right. The last thing you want, you know, again, when you have uh, individuals that are in that title match, and uh, you go, oh, okay, there's lots of mutuals. Okay, you got first first wound. That's it. Um, right, you don't want to make that up on the spot because that, yeah. that's really, really bad. So just, it's just a matter of knowing that there are options and being clear with, uh, the rule set that you are going to go by and making sure that your fighters, mm -hmm. um, are fully aware of the rule set and are okay with, you know, um, what they're getting yeah. themselves into. 
try to change the rules as little as possible after the lay on is called because that's not fair to them if they went in for a fight expecting if I'm hyper aggressive and I can just land the shot a little bit faster than him I'll win well my entire fighting style and the way I've been thinking for the last 20 minutes you just pulled the rug out from under me Ooh. but I think it does bear mentioning right now atomic clock versus shot in motion uh, I think we're using atomic clock right now in the rule set, or is it shot in motion? Are we using? Uh, Do you remember offhand? For 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 tournaments for, or for, just regular? Yeah, for tournaments specifically, because I think it's shot in motion for everything else. Oh look, handy dandy oh. rule book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I'm or gonna explain the two. Tyler, uh, well, the yeah, admiral. Yep. That's... Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, somebody wants to know what atomic clock clock is. <clears throat> Yes. Atomic clock is literally what it says, down to the millisecond who hit first. Uh, there is no allowance. There is no leeway. The first audible pop is the hit that counts. Um, I've got, I have hours of tourney footage and I, I can, I, on camera, I can actually show this to you. Um, it's very hard to tell which sword made the pop in some of these cases. Atomic Clock is very good for, for like that photo finish moment. But it's very hard to reeve on the fly. And something that might have seemed very clear at the time of reeving, live, it came down to your brain associating a sound with what you were seeing. Meanwhile, the shot you saw gra grazed off of garb, and it's the shot you didn't see that made the noise. So I've got footage of that too that's, that's happened. Um, when you're talking about shot in motion, uh, shot in motion is when I throw a shot and I haven't come around to hit you yet and you manage to kill me. This shot still moving still counts. And if it takes you in the same swing, you are dead. Now, I believe tournaments are currently running under atomic clock, which means the first audible pop takes it. But it's that problem in, in finding that atomic clock. And it's the problem in figuring out which shot was the one that made the noise. Um, okay, yeah. It, it's shot in motion. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought it was. It, it's shot in motion right now. It is still shot in motion? Yeah. yeah. Uh, for anyone who wants to call atomic clock, uh, be very careful when you call it. Uh, out of experience, these fighters... A lot of the good fighters I know would most rather call it Simo than to take a cheap win. So, even though they won the match by Atomic Clock, they would still rather call it Shot in Motion. Or So, uh, when you're looking at that and you're, you're running a tournament, realize that that's going to be um, a huge issue that's going to that's gonna happen. So, uh, uh, just to follow up to that, uh, Atomic Clock yeah. basically means uh, no Shot in Motion sometimes it's used uh, yeah. with many mutuals. Um, but yeah, so normally it's uh, it's shot in motion. Yes, it, it is. Atomic clock is, it means no shot in motion. If my sword is out here, way out to my right side, when you strike me in the chest, you get it. Shot in motion, you hit me in the chest, I wrap you in the hip. We're both dead. Because the shot was still in motion. Um, you're going to want to lay out your battle games. Uh, if you want to change the ba deviate from the basic rules of shot in motion, say it's going to be atomic clock, make sure you sh you state that in your bid write-up. Sorry, another follow-up. Uh, atomic clock yep. uh, stops mutuals in theory, but it is hard to actually call. It is it is terribly difficult. If you want video proof, I I think I still have it. Um, from more than one of Wolven Fang's events, um, it, it is it Tyler. is difficult to call. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, most <laughs> writing me a novel, but doing it in separate posts. Uh, remember, twenty second delay. <laughs> we probably wrote this twenty seconds ago. Uh, most fighters wouldn't want their streaks ended by uh, by a DQ. Lol. Uh, another thing. Yep, yep. I'd rather do a double <laughs> DQ instead of atomic clock. Mm -hmm. Um, 
a lot of fighters don't want to be called. They don't want to call to end their streak either. So um, try to be fair to them. Uh, if, if you have two veteran fighters, sometimes you have to give them a minute or two to discuss and do a live replay of the fight to, so they can figure out whose shot landed and who's going who's gonna to bow out of the round. Uh, so all that, all that to be, sorry, all that just to mean budget your time for your tourney. Um, take about seven minutes per match times half the number of expected fighters. That'll give you a, a ballpark timeline. The more rings you have, the more you can divide that time by. Um, you are going to run into these these rules calls, nightmares, and other things. But if you budget a little bit of extra time in each match, you're you're not going to see it till that rules call happens, and it's going to eat up all all the bonus time that that ahead of schedule you were running. But now you're just back on schedule and you're you're good to go. I'm assuming that's coming across clear as mud. <laughs> um, did did you have anything to add uh, for scheduling of battle games or tournaments? Nope. <laughs> so, pre-bid, that is pretty much your job as the Warcrat. Take a look at uh, the games you want to run, figure out what the materials are, the cost... And come up with a schedule. Um, do check the Corpora. If you're running a Coro event, you may or may not have to run a tournament. Sorry, if you're running a Coro or a mid range, you may or may not need to run a tournament at the time. Weapons Master is, is a thing. And I think last week we were talking about Pit Master. Uh, the two-man portion happens at Team Tactics. And the rest of the Pit Master occurs at Bot D. So if you're running either of those events, Four make sure to budget lives. time for those. <laughs> yeah. So sorry, this is all local. Uh, my bad. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, where am I? Where am I? Where am I? That is the pre-bid. So pre-event. All those materials and things that you budgeted for, you're gonna have to go buy, beg, borrow, acquire, um, and. Uh, you're going to have to make your props, make your weapons, make your team markers, make your boundary markers if you need them. Uh, the reef flag uh, can also double as a pretty good boundary marker if you just stick it in the ground in all four corners of the match. It's really easy for all uh, fighters to see. Um, but pre-event, what you're also going to want to do is talk with the Reeves, work with Reeves, um, and help the Reavocrat out, because they have a fairly big job to do pre-event. Getting all of their people ready and qualified and familiar with the rules, you can be a huge help to that. Doesn't help. doesn't hurt for you to review the rules when you're talking about things like the weapons, the, the armor, uh, the weapons check kind of stuff. How much padding do you need at the top of a sword, around it, at the bottom? What type of armor is acceptable? What type of modifiers exist? Familiarize yourself with that kind of stuff. Take another page through the rule book. You never know. You might be surprised at what you find in there. Um, sometimes the rules get changed. Uh, uh, I think V7, what do we have? Seven or eight different revisions of it oh, before the gosh. end of it? And uh, there are a lot of versions, yeah. <laughs> some rules get changed, and you just keep carrying forward that one rule you remember from 7.1, and it's about it gets changed in 7.2, and then in 7.6, somebody was telling somebody else going, well, this is the rule. Well, no, it isn't. When did it change? Like three years ago. When was the last time you read the rule book? <laughs> and they were, they that. were bang I've on. I've heard that before. <laughs> That's, that does happen. <laughs> so... Doesn't hurt to crack open the rulebook and take a reread, but that's that's really all, all you need, pre-event. Get your props and your equipment together, 
Make sure that if you need a dog skull, you have it. If you need baskets, you have it. If you need a phoenix ball, you got it. If you need pylons, uh, specific swords, shields, flails, etc., 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 make them up. They don't have to be perfect. They just have to be there. If your dog skull looks like a Nerf football, it's still good. Functions, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I would, I would add just like, uh, again, uh, just like any other thing, uh, that if there is things that need to be made, right, you want to make sure that you, you have the artisan set up, that, uh, they have specific mm -hmm. deadlines to make sure that, uh, those things are getting done. And for things that you are borrowing, um, making sure that you know how they're getting to the event and how they're getting back. Yeah. Um, you don't have to make everything yourself. Just make sure you show some appreciation in the person who's making the props for you. Um, all right, so the day of, when you get to the field, you're going to want to take a walk around. I know the Reeve, the Reeve of Kratin is the Guild of Reeves are responsible for on-field safety. It doesn't hurt for you to take a walk around the battlefield and look for broken glass, look for syringes, look for, for sharp rocks, look for potholes, whatever. Take a walk around, make sure that everything's good. Make sure that you can still use the fields where you intended to run your games. And make sure that all of the necessary landscape is there to run your games. If you had rented a place with the thought of using a hill at the heart of the field for a King of the Hill match, and uh, the landowner cleared the hill and now it's just a level piece of field, you might need to rethink of things. But that's life. Um, you can always run a ditch game. You can just draw draw a circle for the hill. Um, but you're going to have to, it buys you more time to come up with a workaround to do that site walk on the day of. Uh, your Revocrat will thank you if you come over and give them a hand with weapons check. Um, this is where you're going to want things like your Reeves key. Uh, you're going to want things like a micrometer, rings, measuring tapes, um, and a copy of the rule book because you might have to explain what makes something illegal. Make sure that you're familiar with different types of armor. What makes uh, legal armor illegal? Just because something is completely book legal doesn't mean it's a legal piece of equipment. Um, if somebody you know swings harder than other people brings their great sword and it, the padding is a little stiff, you can still throw it out or tell them they are not allowed to use it. Um, because if they use it, they will leave bruises. Be familiar with what you're looking at and be aware that just because it's written, just because it meets all the criteria, doesn't mean it's legal. Some armor and some garb is also illegal because of pokey bits on it. If my armor is going to shred your sword every time you hit me with it, I will probably be safe, um, but there'll be no foam padding left for when you hit somebody else. So my armor might not be legal. Um, did you have any anything about uh, um. setting up site? I would say the, uh, just one other random uh, thing you might run into. Uh, if you are using like a park where there's going to be other individuals um, also sharing the space, uh, you might have had a specific field and perhaps even like a specific angle of the field that you were expecting to use and all of a sudden there's a family in there and they've got a picnic thing going and that whole thing is right. Um, knowing, uh, being able to adjust and use different areas um and knowing the grounds enough to to know if uh if this is taken then we can grab this over here um but also uh making sure that you get there early enough to to claim the space uh so that you don't show up five minutes uh beforehand and just be like oh no we don't actually have a field to play and there goes the event kind of important to, to reserve the space and be there to, to reserve the space. Um, 
It's a very good point. Uh, I just checked my notes and I realized I forgot to mention two things about the uh, event bid. Make sure you pick out, uh, make sure you make yourself familiar with the different types of tournaments there are. Um, most commonly you see five different types of tournament in any uh, event. Single sword, Florentine, sword and board, great weapon and open. There are, like as in the pit master, uh, two man, pairs fights. We don't see them very often, but if you choose to run that, make sure you're budgeting time for it. Make sure that it's announced before the event. Another thing that's uh, new with Order of the Sharpshooter is archery tournaments. Uh, Wolven Fang, we've been running them for quite some time. Um, there's several different styles. When you're talking about an archery tournament, there is a static shoot, which is um, both I and the Admiral are both uh, archers. So if the Admiral were and I were doing a static shoot, we would both stand at a line or take turns standing at the line to shoot standing targets. Nothing is moving, nothing is dynamic. That's why it's a static shoot. Um, you can take your time to shoot. Is there a time limit? Uh, is there a max number of arrows? How are you counting your points? Um, what I've typically done for myself is what's called a Robin Hood run, which is a run and gun. Shoot the targets as you move. person with the best time and the most points wins. Uh, generally, you run down a trail and off to the left and right, possibly hidden in bushes or, or hanging from trees, are targets. And a reeve will run with you, or reeves are watching from a specific location where they can see all the targets. And they will watch to make sure that you hit the targets. Uh, there's a biathlon, biathlon stop-and-go style, uh, where somebody will run up to a shooting line, stop, shoot at the target until they hit the target, and then they're allowed to carry on down the line. Now, the targets in that case score zero points all the way across the board. It, your inaccuracy is your time penalty. So the more accurate you are, the faster you move. So because there is no standardization on archery tournaments yet, give some thought as to how you want to run those and, and what you want to do with that, because you're probably not going to be able to use the same... Um, you're probably not going to be able to use the same tournament rings you did for the melee tournament. Though, um, I know that there was, uh, I, I read one proposal of, uh, something like a 25 by 25 foot, uh, tourney ring. And you just lock two archers in that and kind of let them the go at each other. One? Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so <They're fun. laughs> because of those, <laughs> Because there's no standardized format yet, um, you're going to have to give some more thought to it. And that one is going to be a little bit more difficult for you to budget your time on. But what I've done so far is I do my main tournament, and I have my other tournaments uh, off to the side. And I can budget it a little bit easier than that by breaking it up that way. Um, also consider if you want to do armored or newbie tournaments as well. Armor, armor tournaments are amazing for for um, posterity shots. If, if you're going to do any advertising with your group, this is going to turn some heads if you get some really good in-combat shots of people in armor. Uh, do be careful with gym floors and griefs, though. <laughs> Alright, so... Uh, back to day of... We've done the walkabout, we've checked the weapons... So everybody's good to fight, everybody's safe to fight, and people have somewhere to fight. You've managed to chase off that uh, wonderful group of picnickers with your boffer swords, so everyone can now uh, get ready for the battle game. First off, hand out bottles of water. Hail Hydrate. Uh, you don't want anyone passing out mid-game. Oh, do we have a question came in? Uh, again, the 20-second the delay. Uh, just a uh... Uh, also a note for uh, armor stuff that you gotta be careful with uh, for like if you are doing an event inside of a gym uh, sabatons also <laughs> greaves and sabatons <laughs> yes yes um just because um steel sabatons will uh, steel sabatons will destroy a floor doesn't mean your leather sabatons will do any nicer <laughs> um most leather work has rivets, and those 
can make a pretty good pokey bit and do a fair bit of damage. Also, it's it's. Um, I was going to say gentlemanly, but but it's uh, it's very noble for somebody to uh, not wear their leather greaves if the other guy can't wear his plate greaves. So kind of just be fair to the other guy. You, but once again, that that is a concern for you as the warcraft. If your site will not allow you to use leg armor, you may want to think about the viz strips that are used by Linagond or um, saying that there will be no leg armor in this tournament and putting it up in advance. Yep. Um, Plan for your environment. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, having chased off the picnickers, <laughs> handing out the bottles of water after you get everyone together... Well, you're the one that brought up picnickers, so... <laughs> I'm not chasing them off, just going, okay, I guess we'll go over here now. <laughs> <laughs> very, uh, very different approaches. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I was enjoying scary, the... It. <laughs> I was enjoying the image of the Admiral chasing after picnickers with a bow with, like, giant <laughs> amp guard heads on the arrows. Um... <laughs> Sorry, um, the Admiral does not chase picnickers off. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm just imagining that she does, and it's absolutely hilarious. Um, no, I have, I have the weird image in my head. <laughs> just, just, like, just like, just picking, like, just doing par target practice where I'm, like, staring them down, just like... <laughs> <laughs> Still want to be here? Still want to be here? <laughs> I wouldn't, but that'd be funny. Um, so <laughs> one comment that came in. Uh, you also uh, have to be careful with uh, someone in plate in general uh, at an indoor location as a fall could be very costly. Yes. Yes, for sure. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, in Linagon, it's something that we uh, we definitely mm -hmm. have to deal with. Um, and a lot of times what we'll do is we'll have fizz reps instead. Um Basically, like, you can have uh, different, like, things to tie on and stuff that resemble or uh, are in place of the thing to show, like, the area that is being covered. <laughs> Basically, uh, it, it, it isn't done to where it's like, okay, no, just everyone has armor out, right? You would actually come with the, mm -hmm. with the armor, right, to be like, I have uh, one bracer. Here it is. They're like, okay then here just wear the the thing on that one location signifying that one bracer you have right it wouldn't be just a free passive just like oh yeah no everyone six point plate you're good right <laughs> like <laughs> oh yeah well <laughs> you know <laughs> i mean you could but <laughs> but yeah again right you're you're gonna just plan for uh Play for the location yeah. that you're in and uh, make sure that you know um, any rules or contracted things uh, specifically so that you're not going to do something that will risk the liability insurance, risk the park being in a financial situation, or breaking any uh, sort of rules, laws, anything like that. Um, because we are a non-for-profit mm -hmm. organization and we cannot risk anything like that. <laughs> um, so, speaking of risking liability and injury and damage... Um, and armor. Uh, coming from a household where we are mostly heavy armor wearers and users, uh, there, there's a certain level of pride amongst armor wearers that, that we wear it in most conditions. If you find somebody is wearing it uh, and they are not wearing it safely, call them on it. If they are wearing it and they are not safe with it on, call them on it. A Gambeson, um, for those of for those watching that have never fought in true armor, think of uh, how you wake up in the morning wrapped up in your big fluffy comforter on your bed, and it's nice, and it's warm, and it's... Um, yeah, it's that, plus 40 degrees outside, plus you're running around and playing amp guard. It gets Celsius. steamy inside of a Gambeson. <laughs> Sorry? Celsius. Sorry? Celsius. Yes, thank you. <laughs> oh, you Americans watching. <laughs> For our American viewers, Stop not your 40, our 40. Uh, <laughs> it's very different temperature. Uh, Ford's like, oh, that's bit. cold. <laughs> uh, no, uh, what is 40? What is 40 Fahrenheit? I think it's, it's got to be about 10, 10 Celsius or something like that. Um, no, 
but but it is it is something that you have to consider and humidity plays a factor these are all important things i have been to events to see people wearing plate mail it's their first event they bought this on epic army they're wearing a full gambus and they've got plate mail on and they're standing there and they've just been running around and they just like a door fell over just nose first into the ground and having worn heavy armor for so long as soon as I looked at the person I said that is someone that hasn't been wearing it for a long time that's someone who's not heat trained in their equipment in the middle of summer they um, a lot of people don't realize how much effort it does take and how much water you will go through uh, to stay up in this armor uh, I think like we can really go deep into this for um, for the medicrat section specifically um, mm hmm all right, well, we'll save it for then. Uh, but suffice it to say, keep an eye out for it and make sure that people are wearing their gear correctly. If you are not wearing your armor correctly, um, it can lead to damage of equipment and damage of property. And we'll circle I back around <laughs> to not wearing equipment. Remind me later. Uh, we'll circle back around to that. Gonna in make a note. I'm literally going to make a note. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, okay, so you've called the battle game. Yeah. You've given out bottles of water. Team balancing. Uh, you or the uh, Reavacrat will handle this. When you're balancing teams, you're you're doing your best to make sure that it's a fair fight. That being said, it doesn't mean that you have to put one warrior on team B because there's one warrior on team A. Sometimes it's perfectly fine to stack all of your warriors on team A and put all of your barbarians on team B. Sometimes that is a, a more fair balance of the game. Not very often, but um, try to balance your classes. Try to balance an ability with the counter ability. If you have a lot of um, quick kill spells on one side, make sure there's a fair number of reses on the other side. Check spell lists first. <laughs> yes. When you get through the classes and you know what everyone's spell lists look like, and then you can start making those decisions. That's usually why I save casters. Either I either do casters right up front or at the end. I don't do them in the middle. Um, a player's class level and skill level. Um, two important things to look at. Your class level and your skill level. Because I have more abilities as a warrior, as a level 6 warrior, than I do as a level 3 barbarian, am I less of a threat? It's a hard question to answer. I still have the same fighting prowess. I have different abilities. In my case, yes, I'm less of a threat as a barbarian. I'm not, a, I'm not as good without my armor. So I'm used to fighting in armor. But it's hard to make that call on people you don't know. If you're running a principality level event, that's going to be a tough sell. So sometimes you might, you might be stuck only using people's class levels to balance a fight. If you can, get a hold of someone from each of the parks that wouldn't, or somebody who knows a lot of people around the Nine Blades, so you can factor in players' skill levels. I have seen level one barbarians dismantle level six barbarians, just because they they are much more experienced in other classes. Do we have uh, another question coming in? Uh, just a comment. Uh, got a balance based on player, not class. But like I said, you don't necessarily know the player in every circumstance. So yeah, it's it's really good when you're able to to uh, ask, you know, uh, folks where they they know the players, right? Getting somebody mm -hmm. from all the parks to be like, hey, so which one is like the best mm -hmm. stick here amongst these two, right? Like, who like who is is gonna be just like really broken if I put them together, right? Like you can get that that inside knowledge, right? Because you could have you could have a six um, level warrior, right, up against, uh, uh, somebody playing peasant, and the peasant be a sword knight, and, uh, they are going to wreck that six level warrior if the six level warrior is not experienced, right? Um, it can be yeah. super broken, uh, very quick. Uh, you can also yeah. do, like, three minutes or so of ditching and then balance. Oh, that's interesting. 
That's interesting. It's an interesting idea. You could actually, yeah, watch okay. and see. Fair. Move yeah. bubbles to the top, yeah. yeah. Um. Also, don't forget to factor in their equipment, too. Because oh, if you see two yeah. guys ditching with no without armor and only using short swords, and then one puts on a full suit of armor, grabs his short swords, and the other one grabs a pole arm, all the rules have now changed. <laughs> um, my, my skill with a short sword and my skill with a bow are two very different uh, <laughs> levels. Fair. <laughs> um, and, and my skill at uh, rhyming off spells is completely unmeasured in ditching, so... Um, but yeah, these are things that you have to check and, and try to balance for. Don't be afraid if you screw up a balance. Um, there's, I don't think there's good games and bad games. I think there's fast games and slow games. A, a one-sided game turns into a fast game. It means it'll be over faster. And then you can rebalance and do it again. Slow games are games that are balanced fairly evenly. And you don't have to rebalance and do it again, so everything went well the first try. Also, if you've got, like, uh, a game where it's, like, it's based on time, let's say it's, like, a six-hour game, right, uh, and you see the the imbalance very quickly, uh, and you know it's gonna be just a really uncomfortable grind, you can make a quick switcheroo, right? It's like, okay, nope, warriors, you, you, you switch. <laughs> like... Okay, yeah. Nope, mm -hmm. nope. The healer, you're... Nope, you're gonna go over there. Druid, why? Why are you... Oh my god. You're just cute. <laughs> Always the druids. Um, druids. yeah. <laughs> you say druids and I can think of healers, and healers make me think of resurrections and respawns. Field layout is a hugely important thing when you're playing games, and you might have to adjust your field layout sometimes, because... Depending on where your respawn location is, or where your Nirvana location is, you could have people walking five minutes to do a 30-second death count. That's not a very good use of everyone's time. <laughs> so, definitely take a look at the lay of the field, and you might change from your original game plan uh, right before the lay-on is called. But try to try to think about the accessibility and how far people are going to have to walk. Um, that's the thing, too. If you do end up having something where it's, like, a very physically demanding thing, like, specifically, right, let's say you have to do uh, your death count at Nirvana or something, and it's, like, really far, um, you might have individuals mm -hmm. that have uh, medical needs. Mobility. Things like that. Mm -hmm. Mobility issues, right? Um, where they are still able to play and that they're not, like, a, a medical danger at all, but, like... Uh, folks mm -hmm. that are aware of the spoon theory, right? Uh, them physically walking that far and physically walking all the way back, that's going to be a, a use of spoons that they can't really afford and they I, won't be able to play the game, right? Um, I have I, been in a situation where there will be special little um, accommodation rules for individuals that are, like, super impacted by those things, right? It's like, okay, so it usually will ta take, let's say, it takes five minutes to walk there and back, Right, you now can do it at base, but you have an additional five-minute death count. Right, uh, so you just have mm -hmm. to right. So it's still fair. It's still um, using that amount of time that you know you would be taken yeah. out of the game to walk there and walk back, but you are not making the individual physically do the walk. Um, so you can also right or just like even add even more time just to really. Um, make it a little bit more even, right? Uh, but you can make accommodations for those that are in need of it. I, I wouldn't even say that it's accommodations for those that are in need of it. Um, though I recognize the spoon theory, I also look at the fact that I'm wandering around in an extra 60 to 100 pounds of steel. I don't want to be walking. I'm, I'm going to get gassed faster, which means I will be oh, yeah. running out of energy and unable to play. And and you're, you're going to sabotage your own game. As... Yep. The Warcraft. You've sabotaged your own game because every heavy armor fighter now has to do a marathon to 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 fight the game. And mobility impaired uh, armored players, even unarmored players. Um, I know if you ask Lord Valiant, he he can go for hours in his armor. But if he doesn't have to do a two kilometer hike every time he dies, he'll be able to go for even longer <laughs> in the battle game. So. Folks um, may just not play because of it, right? And all of a sudden, exactly. you now 
have X mm-hmm. amount of players that don't get to participate in the game that day, right? Um, just yeah. because of that one mechanic you threw in there, um, right? You, you want to make sure that it's something that, you know, everyone can and will want to do, right? So just things now, to consider. With that being said, though, um, excuse me. Um, with that being said, there there is a um, thought that has to be given to is this part of the mechanics of the game? We've run Battle of the Dens for this, the Capture the Flag match where we had a centralized Nirvana because points were scored by the enemy team for deaths on the other team. Kills got points. How do you track that if it's happening at two separate bases? How do you know it's being tracked honestly? How do you know it's being tracked fairly? That might mean that they have to go to a central Nirvana. And that the that five-minute walk is just... Uh, a byproduct of having them go to this central nirvana. Maybe you can move that nirvana closer and still have them go to a center location and not need to go to opposite ends of the world. Just a thought. Um, If it's mechanical... Mm, Sorry? sorry. Also, right, you can also encourage different um, types of play, right? Um, I've been in so many Bhakti battles where... uh, you know, for those CTFs, I I will stay on base duty, right? I will guard the door. I will be the door, right? Um, knowing that I won't physically be able to do that walk all the way to their base or do the Nirvana push, right? So, um, mm-hmm. so knowing that there are different roles in the game itself, right? Um, that it isn't just like to play the game, you must be going all the way over there every single time to to grab the thing. Right, having there be like, okay, you can just stay at base, fight at base, where you don't have to worry about being the person that gets the flag. Right, the whole team doesn't need to just go and get the flag. Right, um, if you have, have a defense thing, right, that can also uh, take care of those with the accessibility needs, so they can still yeah. have a, a role in the game and um, enjoy themselves and have purpose mm-hmm. without having to change, you know, the mechanic. Um, it's all, it's all food for thought at the end of the day. It's your game. And if there's a reason you need someone to do a a five minute hike, then maybe they have to, and, and it's unavoidable. But if it is avoidable, consider why you want them to make that five minute hike. You might just be able to say, all right, your death count isn't, uh, 30 seconds out of Nirvana, five minutes away. It's five minutes and 30 seconds out of at the Nirvana right here. So. Um, accessibility things to consider. Um, so yeah, you've balanced your teams, you've sent them out there, you, you've got the lay of the land. The game finishes, throw water bottles at them again. Uh, especially people in armor. Feel free to offer to dump water bottles on people in armor. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, many a time. The ice bucket challenge was a great thing when people wore armor in the middle of the summer. Um, okay. When you sit down, and th- this is where I spoke about this I- at great length in uh, the Revocrat stuff. When you sit down, you may have to write the ladders for your, uh, for your tournaments. When you are dealing with your tournaments, you need to seed the tournament in the four corners with the top four fighters in the nine blades. You will get that information from the Principality Principality Champion. Hopefully it's Kingdom Champion in two weeks, but we're going to try. Um, For now, the Principality Champion will have that information, and you seed them in the four corners of your tournament. Uh, I have laddered brackets that actually bring me down to a centered uh, winner, if you do not have that style of bracket, you have the ones that just come into a tree, a single point. You're going to want to put them uh, top and the two middle and the bottom. This is to make sure that your four best fighters don't fight each other in the first round. So there's now only one of them that goes all the way to the top. When you seed your tournament, you want to make it as random as possible, with the exception of these four people. A well-balanced, well, 
randomized tournament, you will find that all of your high-quality fighters make their way to around the semifinals. When you go, when you exit your first round, a lot of your new fighters will be gone. By the end of the second round, you would expect to see, if not 90%, 100% of your new fighters are out of your tournament. And that's not because uh, that's not because we don't like new fighters in tournaments. It's they are probably being put up against much stronger opponents at principality level tournaments. At Shire level tournaments, you're not going to see much more than Shire, the players from those Shires, or maybe some of the surrounding parks coming out. So you're going to have a lot of the same uh, talent pool to to draw from. So it's not as big of an issue there. But across the nine blades, there are more potential sword knights than in in one in one a single shire. Um, when you are writing the tournament brackets, you must work in binary numbers. If you have three fighters, you have to have four. Uh, you have to use a four uh, a four bracket. If you have Sorry, I should probably explain what binary numbers are. Binary numbers are exponents of 2. That's 2, 4, 6, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. 256, 512, 1028. Yeah. Um, sorry, 1024. Um, you need to use those numbers when you're writing your tournaments. If you ever wind up in the 1024 number, I want to see this tournament. It'll be amazing. Um... Anytime you exceed one, you bump to the next one. If you have five people, you use eight. If you have seven people, you use eight. If you have nine people, you use 16. Because everybody gets a buy except for the last two or three. Those four people that you seeded into the corners automatically get buys at the start of each tournament. Um, that's because it wouldn't be fair to take your best sword knight in, in the kingdom and put him up against... Um, a brand new fighter in the first round. You're just going to bump that person and move on. That person didn't even have a chance to compete in the tournament. Um, that is about as best as I can encapsulate writing brackets for a tournament in a nutshell. There's a lot of nuance to it and a lot of experience to it. Uh, if anyone wants to have... Uh, if anyone wants a better explanation, feel free to, to post in the comments or... or ask personally and I'll happily go through the whole thing with you and I'll even give you uh, ladder sheets that you can actually see and do uh, mock tournaments on. We also went pretty in-depth de in um, into this category for uh, the Reeve thing so you can also uh, reference mm -hmm. that video. Yeah. I'm sorry it's very dry material. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alright, so that, uh, that pretty much... Sorry? Real quick, just want to give a time check. Um, it is 10 p.m. Uh, we still have to do uh, medic, so mm -hmm. want to just keep a track on time. Did you have anything else for the day of? No, I don't think that's about awesome. It. <laughs> uh, so post event, make sure that anything you borrowed for the event gets back to its rightful owner. Anything that, uh, uh, yeah, that's about it. Anything you borrowed uh, makes it back to its rightful owner. Any uh, receipts you have, make it to the Trollocrat or Autocrat or Fundocrat, whoever's handling the finances. Uh, make sure you get paid out. And that is that. Award oh, recommendations. Uh, if you... <laughs> yes, award recommendations. And if you were the person who ran the tournament, Reeve the tournament, or if it's just your arrangement with the Reevocrat, make sure that the Principality, Chan the Principality Champion gets the results of your tournament. Because that will factor in for the next uh, Warcrat in writing the brackets for their tournament. Also keep track of streaks and provide that information as well. Yep. Super important. Yeah, you might even want to make a post uh, and just like stating um, placements for all the things, right? Just so uh, folks that are interested in knowing that weren't um, able to come or for folks that... Uh, even did compete and just didn't know where everyone um, landed or even where they were uh, themselves, um, just so they can see 
the full breakdown of how everyone did. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions, comments, concerns? Questions, comments, concerns. Again, remember, we do have that 20 second delay, so. Silly long 20 second dance. <laughs> I think we're good. I know a couple of pirate songs, but I don't want to sing them. We're trying to be family friendly. <laughs> this is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> 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 Gotta have that one in there. All these classes, there always has to be the one. 